those who are uh, still lingering in the back there, there are plenty of good chances. Uh, don't, don't be shy. I'm Al Jacobs, and it's my pleasure to be Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine on behalf of President McPherson and Provost Simon to welcome you to the Kellogg Center and to the auditorium and uh, what in some ways is uh, it's sad to see the fourth of our series come to an end this this week we've had a very enjoyable black history month in February and we've been so uplifted by the positive response we've gotten from those of you who have attended previously and uh, I hope those who are here for the first time today uh, will give us the feedback uh, we're looking forward to planning a same series for next year and uh, thank you. I think it's especially important that we brought people from the community to the university, people who under most circumstances probably don't get here that often. And uh, so we're pleased to, to welcome you. As has occurred the last three weeks, it's my privilege to introduce the introducer. Uh, what more can I say that you don't know about Bill Anderson? Bill is an osteopathic physician, a graduate of the Des Moines University College of Osteopathic Medicine. He is a board certified surgeon, now retired, but uh, serves as the associate clinical dean for the state of Michigan for the founding college of the osteopathic profession, the Kirksville College. He also serves on uh, our statewide campus system board representing uh, the Kirksville College. Bill Anderson uh, was there in the days of the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. And he himself could tell you a history. But he has the privilege today of introducing uh, our speaker, who I think you'll enjoy. And I will do one housekeeping item. When we're finished, after a brief question and answer period, we're going to adjourn from this room because we can't serve refreshments here. And we're going to invite you up to the Corniche Room on the second floor. It's not hard to find. And we're going to take the speaker and go there. So if you want to talk to him in the informal period, you're going to have to come to the Corniche Room for a refreshment. And we look forward to seeing you there after this, the program. Bill? Yeah, the area's behind you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dean. Um, the Dean extended the invitation. And let me extend the invitation again for those of you who are sitting in the back. Feel free to come down front. Reverend Moss promises he will not open the doors of the church and he will not take up a collection. <laughs> so it's safe for you to come down front. It is my distinct pleasure to, um, to introduce our lecturer for the day. He hails from LaGrange, Georgia. This is not to say that everyone of distinction comes from Georgia. There are a few from other places, but at least two of us come from Georgia. He came from LaGrange, Georgia. He is a, a graduate of Morehouse College. I can say that Morehouse College is probably the most prestigious of the African American colleges in the United States and has produced more professionals than any other college or university in the United States, including Michigan State University and the University of Michigan. He has been the president, I mean chairman of the board of Morehouse College. Uh, I think this gives you some indication as to the esteem in which he is held even in the college where he graduated. He has been chairman of the board of, of Morehouse College since 1975 and continues to serve in that capacity today. He is pastor of the Olivet Uni Institutional Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. He formerly was a co-pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church that was pastored by Martin Luther King Jr. and his father before him, Martin Luther King Sr. Reverend Moss has been recognized by Ebony Magazine on not one but two occasions as one of the most influential preachers in America today. He is counted as one of the top 15 preachers in America today. He has widely traveled. He has written. He has been invited to China, to Japan, to Africa. He is in demand. So we are privileged to have him. And it's my pleasure to introduce and present to you Reverend Otis Moss. Otis. Dr. Anderson, thank you 
very much for your kind words of introduction. And let me say that our friendship uh, crosses many years. I first met Dr. Anderson in his own home, in Albany, Georgia, several years ago, 1961 to be exact, when he was <clears throat> the leader of the Albany Freedom Movement. A large group of individuals gathered there from across the nation, and he had just returned home from a special rally in Harlem uh, in support of the Albany Movement, and we were taking over his house, which was the headquarters of the movement. Uh, Dr. King, Dr. Abernathy, their families, and A.D. Williams King, the brother of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Jr., uh, Andy Young, Andrew Young, Ambassador Andrew Young, Dorothy Cotton, and the whole family of SCLC. It was a critical moment in the movement. And uh, the things that happened in Albany set the stage for Birmingham. For without the experience and the experiment of the Albany movement, we could not have been successful, uh, I don't think, in Birmingham. And the story, the history of that movement owes uh, an abiding debt uh, to Andy and Norma, to their families, and to those young people, children, and all of the others who put their lives on the line to change the face of this nation. And behalf of them, and uh, many of whom now rest in eternity, I want to say again, thank you for your leadership. I think you ought to give him a hand. <laughs> Dean Jacobs, I thank you for your uh, courtesies extended and the support uh, from your office and the leadership you are giving in this significant college and the contributions that the staff, the faculty, the alumni, alumni family, and those who have been blessed by the expertise of the graduates of this institution. Thank you for your leadership. I want to salute our good friends across the years, Dr. Robert Green, Mrs. Letty Green. Uh, they were both members of our congregation in Cleveland, Ohio, before coming back uh, to this uh, familiar community to continue uh, their professional lives. Uh, I met uh, Bob Green many years ago when he was the scholar activist, director of education, and consultant, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., on loan from Michigan State uh, University. And uh, as you go back through the history of the movement, uh, reading several of the documentations that have been presented, if you go back to Mississippi, 1966, uh, the 
completion of the Meredith March, you will find the photograph of Bob Green planting an American flag at a special statute in, was it Greenwood, uh, Greenville? Greenwood, Mississippi. Uh, even in those days, he was trying to get uh, Mississippi to come into modern civilization, take down the Confederate flag, and salute uh, the American flag. We have watched each other's children grow up. We have laughed together. And in hours and in times of sorrow, we have fervently prayed and wept together. And there is an abiding friendship that strengthens our lives, and it has done so across the years. I want to greet the members of the wider community who have gathered here in this special series, and let me say that I happen to know personally the previous lecturers, each of whom is an individual for whom I have great respect uh, and admiration. Dr. Charles Adams, one of the noted preachers and leaders of this generation, Dr. Wyatt T. Walker, with whom we have worked across the years as chief of staff of SCLC with Dr. King and a pastor and leader and a world traveler and lecturer, Dr. Joseph Lowry, who is president emeritus of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I met several years ago when he was a pastor in the state of Alabama. And it is good that you are getting the testimonies of these individuals who have played such a tremendous role in our national and global lives. I want to say a word today about the global reach of black history transformation from slavery to freedom. Now, I will lift up three or four perspectives in this context, uh, but time will not permit us on uh, this occasion to go extensively into each one of these phases or perspectives uh, but I hope that we can begin a discussion uh, that will last uh, long, long after uh, we have gone, and maybe even a debate that we can continue at some point uh, in or on our journey, wherever we meet, uh, in an academic setting, a church setting, a community setting, are on some street corner where we affirm the movement and the charge that has been given to us. I think uh, each one of us is commissioned by the authority of our unceasing quest to keep the dialogue alive, to keep the debate going, to contribute to the life of the mind, to expand our grasp and engagement and at times confrontation with the stark realities of our being. In the final days of Mrs. Sue Bailey Thurman, 
great scholar and companion of Dr. Howard Thurman, when her daughters found themselves unable to provide for her the -the around-the-clock care as her body was getting weaker and weaker and they were carrying on discussions with her about taking her to uh, giving her residence in in another facility other than her home. She said, uh, I'm not worried, I'm not fearful, I'm not anxious about going into a care facility or a nursing home, but there is one thing that concerns me. I do not want to be cut off from the great conversation of history. She spent her last days, her last hours, really, in a Buddhist hospice, marvelously situated, surrounded by candlelight and appropriate music. And I talked by telephone with a dear friend who was in the room at the time, and she was describing the scenery as Mrs. Thurman breathed her last breaths and how beautiful the setting was for someone to move out of time into eternity, not cut off from the great conversations of history. If we are cut off from those great conversations, debates, the dialogue, the movement, something happens to our minds, our hearts, and our souls. Death creeps in, and life ceases to hold meaning. So it is our responsibility as we look at various aspects of African-American history, our black history, to seek after truth in all of its disturbing fashions. One of my former professors said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, but it will often make you angry before it makes you free. One of the great contributions that South Africa has made to the modern world was to establish the Commission on Truth and Reconciliation, a new paradigm and how nations, individuals, groups, and communities should deal with the pain of past and current brutalities in order to lay the foundation for a new age. No wonder Olive Schreiner, the South African novelist, said, In one of her writings, may you seek after truth. And if anything I have taught you be false, may you cast it far from you and go on to greater knowledge and deeper wisdom than I have ever known. If you become a person of thought and learning, may you never seek to tear down with your right hand what your left hand has built up through years of toil and study, if you discover that at last it is not founded 
upon that which is real. If you become a person of thought and learning, if you become an artist, may you never paint with pen or brush any representation of reality except as you see it. Die poor if necessary, in chains if need be, but never shut your eyes to anything that appears to them to be the truth. History is sometimes painful, disturbing, condemning, and challenging. And speaking of history, I think it was Bishop Sheen, uh, and maybe he was quoting someone else who said, the history is something that Europeans don't like to admit, Asians never forget, and Americans never learn. Uh, that does not apply to anyone here at, at MSU. The first perspective I want to lift up, uh, looking at the transformation from slavery to freedom. Uh, first of all, let me say that if we are to have a comprehensive view, an adequate view of black history or African American history, we must know something about our journey before slavery. We should never begin with slavery in order to get an adequate grasp of our journey. For our lives, our history, uh, our genesis, these are not anchored in slavery. They are impacted by slavery. Uh, when I am doing uh, our Bible series at Olivet and other places, I always say that if you really, if you really want to, to get a clear theological perspective of black history, you've got to start with Genesis. Uh, however, our, our history precedes Genesis. I didn't say it precedes God, uh, but I'm talking about the written record. You have to start with Genesis, for here you see the African presence in Scripture, beginning with Genesis and all through the Hebrew Scriptures, through the Christian Scriptures are the New Testament and the early church, all the way to an African bishop named St. Augustine. But our history begins before that. For I think you will get significant agreement among the archaeologists, the anthropologists, and the historians that Africa is the home of humankind. The beginnings of humanity are anchored in Africa. A few nights ago, I reviewed a chapter in 
the classic work of W.E.B. Du Bois, written, I believe, around 1947, <laughs> The World and Africa. And in that chapter, Dr. Du Bois talked about what I am lifting up now, and here is what he says. The list of things which Africa learned and handed down to us from that far day is enormous. The art of shaving, the use of wigs, the wearing of kilts and sandals, sandals. the invention of musical instruments, chairs, beds, cushions, and jewelry, the burial the burial customs discovered in Europe came from Africa. In Africa, tools were invented. The first tools were stone. Then came metal, copper, especially from Nubia, then iron. The Nile Valley is the cradle of agriculture. So when we look at Africa, before the Atlantic slave trade, we see the ancient empires of Egypt, Kush, Ghana, Mali, Songhe. We see a vast continent, rich and life-giving and sustaining. Sustaining to the wider world, we see two cradles, the cradle of humanity and the cradle of civilization. Some 700 years before the birth of Christ, a gentleman by the name of Shabaka ruled Ethiopia and Egypt. And interestingly enough, in Egypt, during his reign, Shabaka outlawed capital punishment, something that our nation has not yet caught up with except for a few states. It is marvelous indeed, then I repeat, to note that out of Africa came shaving, wigs, beds, shoes, cushions, chairs, musical instruments, burial customs, the art of embalming, agriculture, art, writing, mathematics, engineering, the foundation for modern medicine, government, the works of Imhotep, doctor, teacher, priest, designer of the step pyramid, the first universities and centers of learning, monotheism or the belief in one God. So we could spend a lifetime examining the richness of the black experience or the African experience before the slave trade, before the Atlantic slave trade. Now, having said that, when we examine the Atlantic slave trade, then we must be aware, secondly, that we were brought down to slavery. And it's important to underscore that. Down from Ghana, down from Mali, down from Kemet, down from ancient Ethiopia, down from the cradle of civilization and humanity. Slavery, then, was a declaration of war against humanity 
against civilization, against God. I repeat, slavery was a declaration of war against humanity, a declaration of war against civilization itself, and a declaration of war against God. One poet said, they found them slaves, but who that title gave? The God of nature never formed a slave. Nature and justice must remain the same. Nature imprints upon whatever we see that has heart and life in it be free. Although Aristotle thought that some people are slaves by nature and although Washington, Patrick Henry, Jefferson and the founding fathers were slave owners and although Baptists, Methodists and Presbyterians split their churches over slavery, God is and always has been the God of the oppressed. God's hand is a hand of liberation. When we talk about slavery, the Atlantic slave trade in particular, remember that a people, human beings, were brought down to slavery, down from great moments in history. And slavery always has been and always will be genocide. And all racism leads to genocide. The slave trade was a 400-year traffic of buying and selling human beings. For 400 years, African sons and daughters Generally, the ages of 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, up to 30 were bought, sold, raped, chained, branded, and declared chattel, property, commodity, and auctioned to the highest bidder. By way of contrast, let us never forget that tens of thousands of immigrants came to America to the drumbeat of give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door, said Emma Lazarus, however, African Americans came in chains, scorned, scarred, battered, bruised, and brutalized, and yet we fashioned out a harmony and a melody. In the words of Du Bois, in an ill harmonizing and unmelodious land, one of the great responsibilities I maintain of academia is to produce not merely an intellectual community of scholarship and research anchored in dignity and dialogue and affirmation, but the responsibility of academia is to build a community of conscience, a community of consciousness and a community of commitment, a community of leadership and not just a pool of managers who conspire to do well, gain tenure and retire, leaving injustice, poverty, violence and affliction 
in the place where they found them. Another great responsibility of the academic community is to examine the impact of slavery and racism on the American psyche and ask the uneasy, disturbing questions. What has slavery done to the soul of America? And how does that impact our very lives at this moment both black and white. What has racism done to the psyche of our children and what is it doing now? Can we separate the legacy of slavery from all of the other legacies as though it never happened and cut off the conversation no matter how painful? Let me see if I can illustrate what I'm talking about. Patricia C. and Frederick L. McKissick have written a, a powerfully dramatic and profoundly awakening children's book titled Christmas in the Big House and Christmas in the Quarters. The Big House, of course, being the slave master's house and the quarters being uh, the slave quarters. The setting is on a Virginia plantation. The year is 1859. And in their writing, this is a children's book, in their writing, there is a conversation taking place between a 10-year-old child and her father, who is the slave master. And uh, she puts in a startling request. Well, she says to her father, in her Virginia accent, Papa, can I have a slave for Christmas next year? Can I have my own slave for Christmas next year? All my cousins have their own slaves. And the answer of the father is just as revealing and just as painful as the request of the 10-year-old daughter. For he laughs and says to her, you are too young to have your own slave. But when you are 16 and know how to be a slave mistress, then you can have your own slave. And then reinforces his response with, and there will be plenty of slaves around. However, it is not lost on the writer that this is 1850. Nine. by the time she is 16 thanks be to God some dramatic things will have happened however I make bold to state that this child's request is still alive. Can I have my slave, my own slave, moving throughout the community? Every time somebody 
sells drugs to our children and our children's children or to their parents. They are saying, I want my own slave and my own slave market. Every time a new prison is built, America is saying, we want our own slaves. There is a community in Ohio, not far from Cleveland, just two, three years ago, where the mayor made a prideful announcement with great joy that a new prison was being constructed in his uh, village and that it would mean another million dollars per year in the city treasury. And uh, in talking with, with the individual who directs our prison ministry at Olivet, he said, not only that, Pastor Moss, but there are more people in prison in that community than live in the community. So the prison population in this little Ohio village outnumbers the general population and the leader is glad about it. Can I have my own slave? Every time we look at the numbers of the uninsured and the underinsured, many of whom live in walking distance to the greatest medical centers in the world, and yet they can't get access to the technology because they don't have the right card. The HMO closed down. I was talking. Dr. Green to one of our deacons. You know him well. He's 87 years old. He worked 40 years. Never took a day off. Was never ill. He called me up one day and said, my HMO no longer covers seniors. After 40 years and a gold watch and a pen, he faces the threat in his final years of becoming a slave to inadequate medical care. We must understand slavery and racism and classism and sexism and homophobia in all of their dimensions and raise the critical questions. What are they doing to the psyche of our nation? our children, and uh, ourselves. And let me hurry on, lest I become victimized by the minister that the late Dr. Vernon Johns talked about, who was preaching one morning said, I might be a little longer than usual. I left my watch at home. And he preached 45 minutes. He said, I might be a little longer than usual. I left my watch at home, and he preached another 45 minutes. <laughs> and 
He looked around and said, I told you I might be a little longer than usual. I left my watch at home. And one of the deacons said, well, Brother Pastor, I have a calendar. <laughs> if you... <laughs> I went to a Sunday school class one morning and said, what uh, children? And I asked, what do you think I ought to speak about this morning? One little energetic girl raised her hand and said, say something about, you ought to speak about Moses and tell us about how he crossed the Red Sea and his feet didn't get wet. Another child raised his hand and said, uh, tell us about Jonah and that fish that he lived in and didn't get harmed. And somebody wanted to know about the Hebrew men who went through the fiery furnace and after a while one youngster all the way in the rear of the room kept raising her hand. She said, well, Reverend, I think you ought to speak about a minute and sit down. <laughs> now, I'm gonna, now, I'm not raising that question with you. I, I just brought along a few notes. But let me say, as I move toward my conclusion, that African American history or black history can be one of the most powerful forces for truth and reconciliation. For without truth, there can be no reconciliation. And without reconciliation, there can be no peace. So in order to have peace, there must be truth and reconciliation. There must be justice and love. For justice without love is brutal. And love without justice is weak sentimentality. But love and justice will always strengthen the muscles of the weak. And straighten out, to borrow a phrase, the backs of those who are bent. We have gone through the revolution of the 18th century. We've gone through the revolution of the 19th century. We have gone through the revolution of the 20th century. And in each one of those revolutions, there was an African American presence and dynamic that made the difference between success and failure. Crispus Attucks on March 5, 1770, a runaway slave, to the last soldier in the Civil Rights Army. But who will be prepared to lead the revolution of the 21st century? The revolution to end poverty, violence, economic slavery, and the savage inequality in public education, to borrow a title from Jonathan Kozal. Who will lead the health revolution of the 21st century to guarantee every human being the right to quality health care and 
access to the best technology and human care in history within a spiritually supportive environment. Who will lead the quiet revolution? to reunite medicine and spirituality or provide this kind of care in a supportive environment. It is no accident that when we opened our medical center at the Olivet Institutional Baptist Church, we developed the mission statement, which is more than a statement, to provide excellent medical care in a spiritually supportive environment. I want to leave you with what I consider the mission of black history from generation to generation. It is the responsibility of black history to give to you my story. But that's not enough. Not only must I share with you my story, I must hear and learn your story. And when you hear my story and I hear your story, our story will become our history. For to know your story and not know my story is to get an incomplete grade in a required course in the curriculum of humanity. And if I only know my story without knowing your story, I have not completed the course required for graduation in the university, especially the university of adversity. My story, your story, his story, her story, our story. And when we take each of these seriously, then we know what history means. I, I, I've been to Korea and I've seen it from the perspective of a university where the president said, the principles of this university are the same as the principles of Martin Luther King, Jr. I have been to Dachau and Mauthausen and other concentration camps, and I looked at the other where people were burned. One individual said to me, I was in this camp. And there was a little 15-year-old boy who was given the assignment to rake the ashes from the crematory. One day, he discovered that he was raking his mother's ashes from the oven. I have seen the Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem more than once. I have heard the cries of the Palestinians on the West Bank and I've listened to the anxieties of the settlers. I have walked across the dust of the 
desert in Africa and looked at the pyramids inside out. And I walked up and down the west coast of Africa and I have shed tears at Gory Island. I have chanted with a group of pilgrims as we left El Nino Castle. And the words of an unknown writer still speak to me if I knew you and you knew me and each of us could clearly see by inner light divine the meaning of your life and mine we would differ less and clasp our hands in friendliness if I knew you and you knew me. But if you are to know me, you must know my story. If I am to know you, I must know your story. And I must visit the groans on the trail of tears. And I must hear the cries in the midnight hour. And when we know each other's stories, we can then walk together as truth seekers, liberation doers, and reconcilers one to another. This is our assignment. We may not live long enough to repeat it, but there is no excuse for not doing all that we can while we are able. Thank you. of you who may not have been here during the introduction, uh, we're going to adjourn in a few moments up to the Corniche Room on the second level where you can uh, have some uh, informal interaction with Dr. Moss and uh, some refreshment. Before we get to a, a few questions here uh, and adjourn, uh, we would welcome the Honorable Representative Mike Murphy to the podium for a presentation. Representative Murphy. Or should I call you Reverend Murphy? Good afternoon. One of the joys of my brief tenure in the Michigan legislature has been uh, this month of February and being a part of uh, this great uh, effort by the College of Osteopathic Medicine and uh, Dr. Jacobs and uh, Dr. Anderson. Uh, this is a great gathering. We have heard from four outstanding preachers uh, who have come here to Michigan State University to share uh, their perspectives, their vision, and give some meaning to this African American History Month and to share uh, their story about the Civil Rights Movement and about uh, where we are headed. And so it's just been an honor for me to present to each of the four speakers a tribute from myself uh, as a legislator and from Representative Kwame Kilpatrick, who is the first African American to hold a leadership position in the Michigan legislature and is the son of Congresswoman Carolyn Cheeks Kilpatrick of Detroit, Michigan. And so uh, I was with um, uh, Dr. Moss this morning, and I reminded him when I was a youngster growing up in Chicago, and he'd come to Chicago, 
and I would hear him uh, preach. And uh, he had such a great uh, influence on young minds like uh, myself and Rodney Patterson. Um, and it's just a joy to be able to present this tribute to him um, on behalf of the Michigan legislature. So I would ask uh, if he would come. And it's in recognition of his visit here as a visiting uh, faculty uh, speaker here for the College of Osteopathic Medicine and acknowledging uh, his involvement in the civil rights movement and as one of our nation's uh, great preachers. And it's just a joy to present this special tribute to uh, Reverend Dr. Otis Moss, Jr. So. This is a very formal setting, and so uh, let's have, if there are, uh, a few questions. Uh, Reverend Moss, uh, I'm sure, would be happy to answer. Questions or comments? So much response. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? There's some hands going up back here. Shout out your question from the from the back, and then the lady in front of you. 